all these people, for me, for you, and for millions of others, March 1988 will go down as the time when a major piece of UK legislation came into force and opened up an important new era in consumer affairs. This program is about that section of the 1987 Consumer Protection Act which deals with product liability, a subject important to you, both as customers yourselves and as people working in one of the most important sectors of the consumer market. So, what's new? Haven't we consumers always been protected by the law? Well, only to a degree. For example, when I handed over my money for this pen a couple of years ago, the retailer and I entered into a contract. If it had fallen apart a couple of days later, I could have sued the retailer under the Sale of Goods Act for breach of contract. We find for the customer. There is overwhelming proof that the article in question is plainly of non-merchantable quality. In other words, it's rubbish. Equally, if the pen had failed actually to write, then again, I could have sued the retailer. We find for the customer. The pen is totally unfit for the purpose for which it was sold. So, it's useless as well. But just supposing that one day the pen suddenly burst into flames and burnt my fingers. Highly unlikely, I'll admit. But if that had happened, the safety of the product would come into question. Now, if it could be classed as a dangerous product, the local trading standards officer would prosecute. If not, under the old system, once again, I'd have had to sue the retailer myself. Burnt fingers weren't part of the contract. But he would probably have roped in the wholesaler and the manufacturer, and together they would have tried to prove that none of them was at fault. We find the case not proven to our total satisfaction. Costs are awarded against the customer. In other words, the moment product safety was involved, it used to be a difficult and lengthy battle to get some sort of compensation. Even worse, if the pen had actually caught fire when it was being used by my wife, she would have been unable to sue the retailer because the contract was between him and me. If she'd wanted damages, she would have had to have taken action directly against the manufacturer to prove negligence. And trying to prove negligence was even more difficult. We find in favor of the company that the customer has failed to establish beyond doubt that the manufacturer has been negligent and costs are awarded against her. And in a long case, that can be very expensive. So, to sum up, before the 1987 Consumer Protection Act, if a claim related to the safety of a product, the odds were stacked against the consumer. A defending manufacturer was innocent till proved guilty assuming you could find him. If it was a foreign company and outside the power of British law, you might well have had to have forgotten the whole thing. Although the Sale of Goods Act is still there to deal with purchasers' complaints about products that don't work or don't last, civil claims for injury and damage can now all come under the 1987 Act. So, what's different? A producer is strictly liable for injury or damage caused by a defect in his product. In other words, he has to prove his innocence. Sounds straightforward enough, but what is a producer? A producer could be the manufacturer. Uh, but the alleged defect occurred in a standard component produced by one of my client's suppliers, my lord. In that case, the component maker. But the component maker is Taiwanese and operates outside the jurisdiction of the British courts, my lord. In that case, the importer of the component, someone is responsible. So, the 1987 Act makes certain that someone always has to carry the can. There's no hiding place for those who make or put into circulation defective products. And the Act makes it clear exactly what is a safety defect. A product is defective when it does not provide the safety which a person is entitled to expect. Now, nothing could be more simple than that. Taking all the circumstances into consideration. Aha! A possible loophole. These circumstances are intended to include the presentation of the product. My lord, the company fails to see how its product brochure could possibly have any bearing on this case. If it provided misleading information which confused the customer, guilty. So, no loophole there for the careless producer. 
These circumstances also include safety expectations related to the foreseeable use and misuse of the product. Uh, my lord, surely the company cannot be held responsible for failing to anticipate that a customer would use the product without the necessary protective clothing. I would have thought that such an eventuality was not only foreseeable, but a distinct possibility. Guilty. No loophole for the uncaring producer either. And what if my wife was still having problems with my self-combustible pen? The act is quite clear. It offers a remedy at law to anyone who can prove to have suffered injury or damage to private property caused by a defect in a product. But my lord, since the woman concerned was using the product without the owner's authority, the company contends that any injury she sustained... That does not absolve a producer from his responsibility. Guilty. So, having to prove a manufacturer's negligence goes out of the window. All people now have to prove to establish liability is that their injury or damage was caused by the defect in the product. It's as simple as that. And where two or more persons are responsible for the same injury or damage, all those concerned must share the liability. Uh, my lord, as the hairdryer's franchise repairer, my client contends that the maker's instruction book was open to misinterpretation. This is true. But your client made a possible defect far more probable by using non-approved replacement parts. They are both liable. And when it comes to liability, the 1987 Consumer Protection Act doesn't mess about. But my lord, the amount of damages the customer is seeking would undoubtedly put my clients out of business. If I decide that those damages are deserved, then so be it. The Act puts no limit on the amount of damages a guilty party might have to pay. It's the ultimate deterrent for irresponsible manufacturers. So, in a nutshell, the Act provides aggrieved consumers with someone to sue for possibly unlimited damages. As long as they can provide simple proof that the defect in the product caused the problem, the manufacturer is guilty until he proves his innocence. The boot is now on the other foot. And make no mistake, from now on, the law will have profound implications for every single manufacturer of consumer goods. No matter how responsible they are, there'll always be the risk that some morning a writ will drop onto the corporate mat. If you're a producer, what it now comes down to is how best to manage that risk. Now, for the life of me, I can't imagine any sort of risk involved in a product like this. Innocuous cotton wool balls used in the cosy environment of a bedroom. But there's a warning to keep the bag away from children. You see, a producer can't afford to take anything for granted. Obviously, more risk for a manufacturer here. Electrically powered, moving parts, more complicated to design and make, and its working environment, the kitchen, isn't exactly the safest of places when you think about it. Toys are always a potential risk, if only because of the irrational behavior of the people who use them. This toy has got to be fun to play with and tough enough to put up with the kind of abuse it's going to get. A bit like the real thing, really. <laughs> of all consumer products, the motor car surely carries one of the most difficult risks of all for a manufacturer to manage. Cars are incredibly complex. They move, they share a normal working environment with millions more of their kind, driven by people with a wide variety of driving skills with different senses of responsibility and like all products cars are commonly misused abused and neglected as a safety conscious producer austin rover spends millions of pounds and takes every possible care to design and manufacture its products to the best prevailing standards of safety in addition to all its compulsory legal requirements because it cares for its customers at the same time, the company depends on its partnership with its dealer network to continue and to enhance that customer care commitment. And the implications of the 1987 Act highlight more than ever before the need to reinforce that joint commitment. The reality of the situation is harsh, but it has to be faced up to. If an alleged defect in a vehicle is the cause of serious litigation under the Strict Liability Act, 
the manufacturer will be the primary target, both as producer and the party most likely to afford the limitless penalties that could be imposed. In turn, where it is genuinely not at fault, or only partly at fault, the company's insurers will doubtlessly set out to prove the company's innocence or limit its liability. And that could mean arguing that another party was either solely or partly to blame. It might be a raw material supplier or a component maker. But it could be a dealer outlet or an individual member of the dealer staff that created or helped to create a defect in a vehicle. And don't let's kid ourselves. The unlimited penalties under the Act could be so severe that they could ruin the company or the member of its staff found to be at fault. Because if you are guilty, then from now on, there really is no hiding. The 1987 Consumer Protection Act has made sure of one thing. For companies and individuals involved in the business of making, selling, servicing and repairing manufactured goods, life will never be the same again. Anyone who simply ignores the Act is begging for trouble. Certainly for everyone in the motor industry where the responsibilities for product safety are at their most demanding, what the latest act does require is a total commitment to that fundamental ideal of customer care. And it involves adding another vital element, customer protection. This combined concept of customer care and protection is not only the very best way to look after the interests of vehicle users, it's also the best possible insurance for everyone against the risks of ruinous litigation should something go wrong. So, how can you protect your customers? Where are they and you most vulnerable? Well, the 1987 Act pinpoints four areas where dealer staff now need to be extra vigilant in presenting the product, in giving proper warnings when necessary, in not encouraging vehicle misuse, and in not creating a defect in a vehicle yourself. And to cover these four points, there are seven simple guidelines that are the keys to customer protection. So, let's deal first with that part of the Act which covers presentation of the product. For a start, what does it mean? You're lucky, Mrs. Taylor. You've got a nice Montego automatic to run around in for a couple of days while we fix the Metro. How about that, then? Oh, yeah, you should be all right, Gov. As far as I know, these pads are the same for all Metros. Another lot, then? Now, whether they realize it or not, those people were presenting the product. Or, to be more accurate, they were potentially mispresenting the product. That's as bad as not giving necessary information about a product. I mean, it never occurred to me to ask whether she'd driven an automatic before. If she hadn't, she should have said so. In the opinion of the court, as an expert, you were wrong just to assume the young woman was competent to use the product safely without guidance. By not providing her with the information she needed, you exposed her to unnecessary risk. Guilty. A bit hard? Well, 
Just think about this for a minute. Here's a product that's 100% free from manufacturing defects. It's perfectly safe, providing people treat it with the respect it deserves. So you'd expect a retailer to make sure his staff were expert enough to deal with it, wouldn't you? You'd expect them to sell it only to responsible adults. And you'd expect an expert salesman to make sure that every customer had the instructions and warning information they needed to use it safely, wouldn't you? Because in by far the vast majority of cases, it's not physical defects that make products unsafe, it's the user. Consumers take products for granted, and motoring is especially prone to that kind of problem. That's why, as experts, people in the trade have to take a protective attitude towards all their customers all the time. So, the first guideline for customer protection is be an expert. The only loan car I can let you have is an automatic. Have you driven one before? No expert can ever again automatically assume a customer has the knowledge, skill and experience not to put themselves at risk. After all, knowledge, skill and experience are the things that make someone an expert. And if all your customers know more about motoring and the product than you do, you shouldn't really be in the job. Now, a Metro Turbo is quite a step up from a Mini, Reverend. Are you sure a performance car is what you were looking for? I can see your weekend's going to be busy, Gov. Are you sure you've sorted out the right bits for the job, then? It only takes a couple of simple questions for a real expert to get a clue as to how much and what sort of customer protection a person is likely to need. Then you can give them the expert information they need. As you might expect, the 1987 Act takes an equally dim view of false information as it does of no information at all. It means that if a product fails to live up to the degree of safety a customer has been led to expect, then it's defective, even though it may be 100% perfect when it leaves the factory. So, the second customer protection guideline has to be always give expert information. And that applies to every way you present the product. The ad looks good, boss. You're safer with a rover from Turner's. <laughs> I am mystified. Did you mean that Turlins are safer to do business with when you buy a rover? Or that a rover from Turlins is more safe than anyone else's rover? Or that a rover is safer than any other car? Guilty of providing confusing, inexpert information. The best way to protect your customers is to use only the advertising, promotional material and literature that's been produced or approved by Austin Rover experts. I'm afraid we've run out of the latest brochure on that particular metro, Mr. Pierce. Bit of luck, though, I've managed to find you an old one. Did it not occur to you that if the model brochure was out of date, the information it contained might also be out of date, and therefore irrelevant to the customer's needs? Guilty. The best way to see that your customers are protected is to always make sure that a product has the correct written material to back it up. And to be on the safe side, throw out any official literature as soon as it becomes obsolete or is superseded. Mind you, giving false information by default is bad enough, but presenting wrong information as gospel is unforgivable. You are honest enough to admit that you informed your customer that those particular brake pad fittings were suitable for all Metro models. How on earth did you come to make such a fundamental mistake? Because he didn't know his product well enough. The best way to protect your customers is to make sure you have an up-to-date expert knowledge of the job and the products you sell and service. With that information at your fingertips, you can always deal in facts. And it's very quick off the mark. I reckon it will out-accelerate almost any car on the road. Uh, let me see if I understand. You were in your Montego Turbo trying to pass the Ferrari. An expert sticks to the facts. And the only facts you can trust are the ones issued and approved by the factory. You can't protect your customers by just inventing information that one day their safety might depend on. Safest seat on the market, this one. Your nipper will survive anything in this. The safest seat? Survive anything? Guilty. An expert doesn't get carried away by over-glamorizing or exaggerating the performance of the product, especially when safety is involved. Again, the best way to protect your customers is to stick to the official facts and figures. 
If you always keep your information simple, clear and accurate, then there's no chance of a customer getting it wrong. And that applies particularly to the information you put on paper. Right. So far, we've dealt with being expert and giving expert information. But there are times when the expert way to protect customers is to give them a positive warning. Right then, Mr. Stewart, before I take you through the basic controls of the car, here's your owner's pack and service book. Whatever you do, make sure you read it as soon as you can. It contains all the information and safety tips you'll need to get the best out of your car. A clear enough instruction without putting the wind up the customer. And that's the third customer protection guideline. Give expert warnings if you need to. And there's no better time than when you're handing over a new car to a customer and setting him up for two or three years motoring. What's more, the owner's handbook is full of sensible warnings and cautions that are there to protect him. Now, to be honest, Gov, if I were you, I'd make sure you got the right pads. Pre-84 metros have got either an A or a B system. If you just let me look under your bonnet, I'll double check. Can't afford to mess about when you're dealing with brakes, now, can you? I cannot see how the customer can blame the assistant in the parts department. I am satisfied he gave a sensible warning and he offered to help, both of which the customer chose to ignore. All done, Mrs Caldicott, and we've fitted the factory approved roof rack as you wanted. Uh, the instructions are here, so in the future you'll know how it's done. Oh, and you ought to read the warning so as you don't overload it. In sales, in parts and in service, the handover of a product to the customer is the last chance to be sure that the obligation to protect the customer by presenting the product properly has been fulfilled. Because it really boils down to making sure you've got the right information and that you pass it on to your customers. You must assume that they know a lot less about motoring and the products than you do. But there's a big difference between making sure your customers are aware of possible risks and unintentionally exposing them to actual risk. The next part of the Act says, a product is defective when it does not provide the safety which a person is entitled to expect, taking into account its foreseeable use and misuse. Now, all car designers and engineers know that some owners misuse vehicles the same as consumers abuse all products. And all that has to be taken into account right through the design and development stages of a new car. Mind you, when it comes to maltreating products, some consumers can reach heights of inventiveness far beyond the imaginations of the best designers in the world. No, no problem at all, Mr. Hooper. I'll order up a tow bar kit and get it fitted in time for delivery. I didn't know you were a boating man. Do you mean to tell me you didn't ask? You specified this tow bar kit without finding out what the total towed weight was likely to be, whether the existing trailer was braked or not, and therefore whether his new metro could safely manage? Because things like that tend to matter if you're on a winding one in four in the Alps. If you don't know how customers intend to use the product, you might be unintentionally aiding and abetting them to commit a real insanity. So don't be guilty of not asking the right questions. And don't be guilty of misguided advice. Yeah, yeah, I know the sort of wheels you mean. The ones with the built-in spaces. But we don't stop that sort of stuff for Metro. Your best bet's that motor sports shop in town. I appreciate you were trying to be helpful. But as an expert, why on earth did you not make it quite clear that the use of such wheels is expressly not recommended by the manufacturer? And he could have told the customer he might be throwing away all the protection the new act is designed to give him if he ignored the advice and went ahead anyway. But sometimes it's not easy to keep enthusiasm under control. I know exactly what you mean. It's the same in my Montego. Just time it right. Drop a cog, put your boot down. You could end up in intensive care. Heaven knows I'm not criticizing your enthusiasm for the vehicle concern. But fueling customers' fantasies and misconceptions to a point where they underestimate the risks of motoring is not the best way of protecting them. I am not impressed. So, the fourth customer protection guideline has to be experts don't encourage product misuse. And keeping silent when you should nip customer over-enthusiasm in the bud is just as bad. Now, up to this point, we've been dealing with situations where risks to customers have arisen because products don't match up to the way they've been presented or customers have been positively encouraged to misuse them. 
But what if a product leaves the factory with an actual physical defect? Who's at fault then? The manufacturer? Not necessarily. It could be the company that supplied the raw material or component. Or... I cannot accept your contention that you are not to blame. You were paid by the manufacturer to do a full pre-delivery inspection, and you were under an obligation to fulfill their duty properly. Had you done so, the defect in question could not have failed to come to your attention. Guilty. More than ever before, when handing over a product to a customer, whether it's new or has been serviced or repaired, every person in the customer protection chain has to be confident that they've done their individual best not to expose the customer to additional risk. And if you're someone whose personal attitude tends to be... Ah, <coughs> oh, nuts. Let someone else sort it out. The evidence is irrefutable. You quite deliberately put this customer at risk. You knew the defect existed, you were capable of doing something about it, and yet you did nothing. How can you stand there and tell me you were not solely to blame? And a defect needn't be necessarily safety-related to distract a user and cause an incident that leads to injury. Sometimes, of course, defective products are knowingly put back into circulation with the best of intentions. Now, I know you need the car, Mr. Howard, so I've ordered the part and it'll be here in a couple of days. But until we can fix it, you better take it easy. Did it not occur to you at the time that in your efforts to keep the customer contented, you exposed him to serious risk? Surely customer safety and customer satisfaction are not mutually opposed. I'm really sorry, Mr. Howard, but I'm just not prepared to put you at that sort of risk. We're doing all we can to get hold of the part locally, and if not, it's on a 24-hour delivery from the factory. I know it's annoying, but you're a good customer and we've got to look after you. If you're really desperate, I could organise a loan car. Which only goes to prove that an expert can often turn an awkward situation into a PR success. It can all be summed up under the fifth customer protection guideline. An expert spots and puts known defects right first time. But surely one of the most important guidelines of all has got to be an expert never creates defects. It's still not dead right, but it'll just have to do. I've got that maestro to sort out before three. Oddly enough, you'd think there were thousands of ways of possibly creating a defect in a product, but when you boil it down, there are only two. The first is doing a defective job. People who can't or won't do every job well and get it right first time always were a liability. Now, they could be a strict liability, just waiting to put their firm and themselves in court and out of business. So, the chips are down for some people. The only other way to make a product defective is to make a mistake. Sorry, P, that bit you wanted for the metros on order. If you pushed, I could pick one up down the road. They're cheaper there anyway. Didn't you realise that you were running a risk when you made the mistake of supplying unapproved parts? I cannot see why a manufacturer should be held responsible for defects in, or for that matter, created by just any non-genuine parts and accessories which you may decide to fit to their product. So, whoever decides not to fit Austin Rover approved parts and accessories has also decided to accept responsibility if anything goes wrong. And so have these two. Well, it says here, for the suspension unit, use tool number 18G1535. Here you go, use this instead. It'll do the job just as good. Do you mean to tell me that you consciously made the mistake of using the wrong tool for the job, even after you had checked the manual? What do you think the manufacturer prints them for? There you go, Davy. One Maestro wheel bearing coming up. Had you consulted the parts list and checked the vehicle identification number, you would have seen that the part you provided the service fitter with was the wrong one. Another mistake. Let's be clear. If something's not exactly right, there are no half measures, it's wrong. And doing a job wrong is not the way to protect the customer. Nor is thinking that you know better than anyone else how a job should be done. There's only one way to be sure you're doing things the right way. And that's the last of the guidelines. An expert does it by the book. Whether it's a workshop manual, an instruction in a box, a parts list, a label, or whatever. They're all part of Austin Rover's definitive guide to customer protection. And they're all there for a purpose, so that people who use them properly won't make mistakes. 
Oh, no, not more service bump. They must think we've got nothing better to do. ...than to keep you bang up to date with all the vital information you need to do the job properly. Don't make the mistake of ignoring bulletins, of not keeping on top of the paperwork, or not destroying all the obsolete information that may cause other people to make mistakes. It wasn't my fault. I went by the manual, like I always do. But no one had updated the information. Guilty, or at least someone is. So, if you do it by the book, you won't make a mistake, the job will be done right first time, you won't make the product defective, and you'll have done your bit in the customer protection chain. Because from now on, the concept of customer protection has to become an indispensable part of the working life of everyone in the dealer network. Now, although the Consumer Protection Act will impose new working disciplines on everyone, there could be considerable benefits as well. By your own admission, you were more than satisfied with the vehicle and with the dealership that supplied it. And yet, to save a pound or two, you had it maintained by a non-franchised workshop who admit to fitting non-approved imported parts. Surely it was in your own best interest to stay with the people that were looking after you properly. So, as customers get to know more about the benefits of the Act, they're more likely to stick with the experts who are best able to provide the protection to which they're entitled. The key is the quality of customer care and protection that all of you must now give. So, use the new guidelines that will make customer protection a reality. Always be an expert. Now, are you happy you're sure you know what you're doing, Gov? If you're worried, we'll see what we can do to help. Always give expert information. Oh, driving an automatic is pretty straightforward once you know how. Come on, I'll give you the handbook and show you the basics. Experts always give warnings when necessary. It's a great car and you'll love it. Give the engine a chance to bed in for at least 500 and that'll give you a chance to get the feel of it as well. Experts don't encourage product misuse. Look, I know them sort of alloy wheels look dead flash and all that, but if we don't supply them, there's a reason. They're not recommended, and that's that. Experts spot defects and put them right first time. I know it's only the heater duct, but what if the screen keeps misting up on the motorway? Experts never create defects. Well, it says here, use tool number 18G 1535. And experts always do it by the book. It says here in the parts list that that part's been superseded. Now, if you can't give me the chassis number, I'm not going to guess. So, if you think about it, the idea of customer care and protection is surely the very best form of insurance policy. For the manufacturer, its dealer network and staff, but most of all, for the customer.